Alhadun Tebong, who is an activist leader, a human rights advocate, and the director of Tibet uh, Action Institute uh, based in the US. So Laden will uh, talk about how and why Tibet holds the key to making China accountable. So I'll have it over to Laden. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's an honor uh, and a pleasure to be here amongst many old friends and such esteemed guests and fighters. I can feel the strength from the stage has actually given me energy when I'm feeling a little bit jet-lagged. Um, so today I wanted to talk just briefly about Tibet as China's laboratory for repression and Tibet as our laboratory for resistance. Um, for far too long, Tibet has been a laboratory for repression, a place where the Chinese authorities have tested and sought to perfect systems of mass surveillance and control and to create the ultimate police state. They don't let Tibetans out. They don't give them passports. They pursue and arrest, torture, and even shoot Tibetans who try to escape. They punish the families and the communities these people leave behind. And they don't let most foreigners in. They require special permits, tour groups, background checks for visitors. They ban the media and diplomats, and they refuse to give the vast majority of exiled Tibetans permission to return. They have disnified Tibetan Buddhism while emptying out the monasteries and the grasslands and trying to remove, to remove Tibetan language from the tongues of the most vulnerable and impressionable, the children and the young students. And just when we thought the repression couldn't get worse, it did. When Chen Chuangguo was made party secretary of the Tibetan Autonomous Region in 2011, he took the repression to a whole new level. His Orwellian grid system of social management, his 700 convenience police stations built at 500 meter intervals from each other, 12,000 new recruits called in for police related activity, and households that were made to spy on each other in the double linked household management system. In 2012, Chen oversaw the mass detention of Tibetans, mostly retired and elderly people, returning from His Holiness the Dalai Lama's Kala Chakra teachings in India. In an unprecedented move at that time, these people were held for months at hotels, schools, military training centers, and bases. They were interrogated, ordered to denounce the Dalai Lama, and forced to attend patriotic re-education sessions. Many became ill from the stress of the experience. Some never recovered. Others died when they were released. And then in 2016, Chen Chuangguo moved to East Turkestan. And the system of surveillance and repression it took him five years to roll out in Tibet, now tried and tested, took only two there. He's implemented the grid system of surveillance, the convenience police stations, I understand 50,000 new hires for police-related jobs as of last year. And now this massive system of detention camps that is absolutely breathtaking in its scope and its potential for escalation. Faced with the reality of this crisis of oppression, I believe all of us are asking ourselves the same question right now. What can we do? What can our governments do? How do we get the Chinese government to stop or to pull back in any way and change these policies? The situation is so bleak and often it seems like what we're doing may not be working at all. But as bad as things are right now in all the regions that we're discussing here, uh, I believe we can look inside Tibet and see that the answers to the very difficult questions lie in resistance. Over the past six decades, we have witnessed wave after wave of Tibetans resisting China's rule in myriad ways, despite the violence and the excruciating suffering they surely know they will face as a result of their actions. In March 2008, across all three historical provinces of Tibet, Utsang, Amdo, Kham, which on the map today uh, that China has redrawn, redrawn, means both the Tibetan Autonomous Region and the vast areas outside of the TAR, which have been incorporated into Qinghai, Gansu, um, and Sichuan, 
we saw a new generation of Tibetans raised entirely within the Chinese system, with no memory of an independent Tibet, risk everything to come into the streets, to demand their freedom, to demand an end to Chinese rule, and to call for the return of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. This occurred in spite of the years-long campaign and massive amount of resources Beijing spent on propaganda and security measures to ensure there would be no visible dissent in the lead-up to and during the Olympic Games. And I think this is the beautiful truth that is the paradox of repression. The more the authorities try to suppress and control the people through intimidation, coercion, and violence, the more the people will resist and the stronger their desire for freedom will grow. We have seen this to be true time and time again in Tibet and in the other places that now China controls, rules Hong Kong more recently. Even today, in spite of the wave of violence and repression brought to Tibet since the 2008 uprising, Tibetans continue to resist and to challenge Chinese rule. Whether promoting traditional livelihoods, defending language and land rights, working to stop destructive resource extraction projects, Tibetans are advancing the struggle for rights and freedom through creative and organized nonviolent action. And so as much as Tibet has been a laboratory for repression all these years, it's also been the laboratory for resistance. One where Tibetans are constantly testing out new strategies and tactics of defiance and resistance, and they are doing it against all odds in a place where there is virtually no political space to move or even breathe. And this is where I want to draw attention to the Freedom House reports again. You know, you really have to look at the list by aggregate score and see Tibet there year after year as a place. Syria minus one, Tibet one, and then North Korea, Western Sahara, South Sudan, year after year, you know, Tibet there with a minus one next to. Uh, I think many people don't realize how, how bad the situation is, how f little space there is for, for anything. But yet the people continue. So in seeking answers to hold China accountable, I think the international community must take uh, its lead from Tibetans. Over the past two decades, Beijing has successfully muted criticism of its human rights record and derailed momentum and support for Tibet from world leaders and national governments through a lethal combination of sharp and soft power. They've taken open debate and discussion of China's rights transgressions out of the spotlight and into back rooms where our governments are led in circles of fruitless talks by their counter, Chinese counterparts. <clears throat> one by one, they've picked off some of the most powerful nations and leaders on earth through brash bully tactics meant to punish and isolate any who meet His Holiness or who show open support for Tibet. And as these strategies have worked, Chinese leaders have been emboldened. They have become more brazen. We, see, we are seeing them steadily escalating repression in Tibet, in China, and in the nations and territories they control. And now they're seeking to normalize and export this authoritarian model to the rest of the world. Clearly something has to change. If there is no cost to Beijing for all of this abuse, if there is no price to pay, be that social, political, or economic, things are going to continue in this downward spiral. It's time for our governments and indeed all of us to show some courage and do what Tibetans in Tibet have done all these years. Stand up to the Chinese government using new strategies and tactics and also to re-engage in the tried and true strategies and methods that worked well in the past. Most simply and easily, I think like-minded world governments need to get together and formally engage in joint initiatives to defend Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians, and Hong Kongers. They should return to publicly meeting His Holiness the Dalai Lama. They should also meet with the president of the Central Tibetan Administration, Dr. Um, Lobsan Sangay, as the legitimate representative of the Tibetan people. If these governments take action together as a group to defend human rights, democracy, and free speech, and they stand up to Beijing as one, it will be far more difficult for China to retaliate in the ways that we have seen them do so in the past. Perhaps in this time of economic uncertainty and trade wars, whatever you think about that, now is the time and the moment to test such a strategy. In the past year, we have seen 
Uh, we've also seen China's multifaceted efforts to influence global politics and opinion spotlighted like never before. The spike in awareness of Beijing's attempts to bend all of our thinking to the, their authoritarian worldview has created favorable conditions for us to campaign and to challenge and block China's efforts to infiltrate our free and open societies with insidious soft power programs like Confucius Institutes. We've been campaigning against Confucius Institutes and classrooms in the Boston area. We see it as important as a region, uh, as a global destination for world-class education. And we've had a positive response so far, unlike in the past on this issue. Within just five months of launching our campaign, we've seen multiple high-profile media, media stories, including a Boston Globe cover page story. We've seen statements and letters of opposition in our area from two high-profile congressmen. And now two of the universities, UMass Boston and Tufts University, are in the process of reviewing or seriously rethinking their Confucius Institute partnerships. And I'm happy to announce here for the first time, Cambridge Ringe and Latin High School, probably one of the top public high schools, not just in Massachusetts, but in the entire United States, last month officially ended their relationship with the Confucius Institute and closed their Confucius classroom after advocacy efforts led by local Tibetan students from that school and Tibetan alumni. <laughs> At the same time, there is great strategic opportunity to target China's attempts to normalize and export its draconian censorship and surveillance policies. We need to unite and challenge Google and other tech giants like Apple and Facebook who are playing into Beijing's plan to undermine global human rights norms by arguing that their moves to engage in censorship in China are nothing more than a business necessity in order for them to respect local laws. There must be a cost to them and to China for taking us all down this dark road. And there is a rising interest uh, in a campaign like this amongst diverse groups of NGOs, activists, technologists, and others, and many people here today, rep representing such a diverse array of groups and interests. We all can play a role in making such a campaign, which is incredibly relevant and timely, very potent and effective. Finally, in closing, I just want to bring us back to Tibet as a laboratory for resistance that we can all learn from. I think if six million Tibetans armed only with their Buddhist faith, faith and desire for freedom can time and time again stand up to one of the most populous, powerful, and violent nations on earth, then can we not do more? As we sit here on the eve of China's UPR, it seems clear that it is time for governments to put their resolve to the test and to speak out and put their concerns over China's horrific human rights violations on the record and in the most <clears throat> powerful way possible. Thank you.